But so we have asked Susie to actually change up and to start us with the global picture instead of the local picture. And it, whichever way we do it, whether we start globally and work down locally, whether we start locally and actually put that into a global context, it really doesn't matter. So I'd like to welcome uh, Susie Walsh from USC Canada, and she'll tell you about herself and what USC is doing on both the global and the local picture. Good afternoon. It's, it's such a delight um, to be here with you. I was just telling someone that I have been at um, the last four weekends, I've been working, so you can, you know, kind of go, whoa. But it's been um, attending conferences and events like this one with amazing people. So really, it's been just such a, such a wonderful four weeks of, of really recognizing that there's this incredible group of folk out there doing amazing things and I'm especially delighted to be here amongst people doing amazing things with seed. Um, on your uh, screen a minute ago was a slogan, uh, focusing locally and connecting nationally. Um, I would like us to remember that we're also connecting internationally um, and um, had um, our friend here, um, the woman that um, was supposed to be here to give the blessing and to, to launch the conference, had she started, to, she would have talked a little bit about um, the importance of recognizing and acknowledging the unceded territory and the gift that we've been given to be able to be on this amazing land. I would like to remind us that um, the reason we are here is because there are seeds from farmers um, all around the world that were carefully nurtured and brought to this country and so maybe we can just take a moment as well to acknowledge the incredible work that those original farmers have done around the world to ensure that we do have the vibrant seed system that we have today. So maybe just a round of applause for those farmers. And because we have a little bit of extra time, um, I thought I'd start with um, a, a video, a short video, it's only eight minutes, um, about a program that USC Canada uh, launched in the mid 80s um, or late 80s uh, when Ethiopian farmers, um, and I th you probably realize that Ethiopia is the center of origin for a lot of important crops, including a cup of coffee that gets you through your day. <laughs> And um, farmers were forced to eat their heritage, basically, because of the famine. Um, and so this program was the result of um, a very visionary scientist, actually, from the Gene Bank, the National Gene Bank, who recognized the importance of getting seed back into the hands of those farmers, and their indigenous varieties that had been well adapted to their local soils and local growing conditions. And when he went to the field, um, to meet with these farmers, he was very humbled because he recognized and discovered, in fact, that farmers had indeed buried seed deep into their soils because they knew that that was their future. They knew the importance of, of guarding and safeguarding that, that incredible plant genetic um, heritage. And so it began this relationship and, and bred or the seeded the development of a program that we call Seeds of Survival. And it does feature um, seed banking, which is um, a strategy. It's kind of like a safety deposit box that, of course, seeds need to be kept alive and grown in situ and constantly grown out. But in communities where there can be um, very unpredictable weather conditions and things like famine, it is important to, some, to some have, have some of that genetic diversity in their, in their seed, in their local seed bank. So, I'll share that with you, and then I would like to go on to a, presen a presentation that focuses more on um, some very exciting news um, for Canadian uh, seed producers and uh, farmers uh, in general. So we'll start first with this short video called Banking Diversity. Um, so just, I'm gonna say a couple of things about me because I do have some, I, I did spend some time here in BC between 77 and 84. I went to Simon Fraser and um, 
I was running along the beach the last couple of days, staying with a friend in Kitts, thinking, whatever possessed me to move. Uh, it is so, when the sun is glorious in the skies, it's, uh, it's such an amazing province. I'm so envious of you. Um, of course, had I uh, stayed here, maybe I wouldn't have had the journey, uh, the wonderful journey of, I've had to, got to experience over the last uh, year since that time. I won't say how many decades and age myself too much, but it's been decades and decades. Um, and uh, I stayed with a friend in Kitsilano who I knew from, from those days, and she's um, a prof at UBC, and she asked me if I wouldn't mind contributing to a blog that's entitled um, Suffrage, Women's Suffrage and Beyond, uh, and to write uh, a short piece about the food system and democracy. And I thought about it. Oh, you know, I hadn't quite been thinking about it in that way and actually have ended up changing the title to this little presentation as a result of that. I've titled it Seed Sovereignty is Food Sovereignty, Building Democracy One Seed at a Time. And I told you that I've been attending these various meetings over the last four weekends, starting in Rome, um, the Committee on World Food Security, uh, and then moving on um, last weekend to, you know, starting at our board meeting where Robin was there. <laughs> Um, but moving on to Rome for this Committee on World Food Security, and then after that, um, Food Secure Canada. How many of you here were at the Food Secure Canada meeting in Edmonton? Edmonton doesn't roll off the tongue like Rome, but um, <laughs> it was a great meeting. And, and then, of course, coming here. And, and when I thought about it, what, you know, the convergence of the food crisis, the financial crisis, and the climate crisis really is about um, a system that isn't sovereign and about a system that, that is really um, broken and needs to be fixed. And it is the folks in these rooms, people like you, I believe very strongly, are the most hopeful folk to make this system a uh, better system, to repair the system. Food is something that everybody can relate to. And more and more, they think about those seeds because seeds have that tactile and wonderful quality about them that I think, you know, we really are onto something here. You know, auto the, 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 the work that's being done um, around uh, food and seed sovereignty, to me, is really what's going to help lead us into um, a more democratic system. And I think I'll be able to explain why as we move along. So um, nine of out of ten bites of our meals around the world begins with seed. So seed, <laughs> seed is, is critical to our struggle to make, um, to build a better food system. So I told you I'd tell, your, tell you a little bit about myself. Um, this is um, the road into a village that I spent, uh, I was there on and off in uh, during the year 2000 doing research with potato farmers. Um, that's me with one of the a group from one of the communities that I uh, spent time with. And they were really the ones that not only taught me about, um, as an anthropologist, about um, you know, farming systems and ecological agriculture and the importance of seed and um, the importance of working with nature, etc., but also about the question of um, democracy within the system and what happens when there is no democracy in that system, when they are being forced to use um, seeds from uh, afar uh, because they're tied to an industrial food system model that insists that their seeds aren't good enough, that their knowledge is not good enough. Um, and yet that knowledge system, uh, because the farmers in these communities were really very much a part of uh, the Green Revolution approach to food production, where they were given introduced potatoes from Argentina full of diseases, diseases that had never been in the area before, um, and, you know, encouraged to use the various kinds of synthetic chemicals that would help them survive on and thrive in those landscapes. And, of course, we do know that after a couple of years, they don't thrive any longer, and it becomes a vicious cycle of having to go back and get more seed, or in the case of potatoes, tubers, etc. 
But despite that um, system, which was very intense in their region, um, they were able to and maintain this kind of diversity in their potato crop. So there's about 69 different pairs of uh, different distinct varieties. You can see the big fat Dutch ones um, in the front. Um, of course, that's part of the system now too. Those are the introduced ones. Full of water, but great for French fry machines. Um, and the others, of course, are, um, you know, potatoes have, of the major food crops, the highest, those potatoes, those potatoes, not the big fat water Dutch ones, the highest protein levels um, of any of the major food crops. They're full of antioxidants um, and really very nutritious. When I first got there, I thought, how do the people survive on all these potatoes? You know, like I always thought of potatoes as lots of starch and, you know, some good qualities, but really they weren't going to be the core of my diet. But these are not just potatoes. They're, they're full of all kinds of, of nutritious um, qualities. And also they have other kinds of tubers, of course, that they grow as well that are also equally um, nutritious. But the big ones were the ones that were pushed on them. And, you know, so, so basically uh, what I discovered through that year um, working beside these farmers and learning from them was that, that inherent in their system, their indigenous knowledge systems, was a very, very strong sense of community and a strong sense of sharing of knowledge and sharing of responsibility. A real inherent democracy in the way that they interacted with each other. This is just a little exercise that our partner does with um, communities in an effort to try to sort of rebuild that valuing of that very strong sense of, of coming together and of working together. Um, and uh, I just like it because it's capturing how connected um, we all really are and that exercise is one way of starting to talk about that, that everyone's knowledge is important and everyone's um, contributions are important. So I come with you from Ottawa with good news for a change because heaven knows there's not a whole lot of good news from Ottawa these days um, about something that is intended and should build uh, democracy in this country and that is a new initiative around seeds called um, the Bauda um, family initiative on Canadian seed security. How many of you have heard about it, have heard rumblings about it? Oh good, <laughs> you're waiting for the news. <laughs> well, um, in, in the, and the title by the way is going to insert family in there. Um, that's the most recent uh, discussions and I think it's a good insertion. Even though it's a long title, it really is trying to get at the fact that this is about you know, valuable to um, and, and led by smallholder or family farmers, etc. So the goal is um, a seed system that serves us as a, a foundation for food security, climate resilience, and community well-being. And I really want to underline that last part. Um, this is um, a, a little sort of illustration of the kind of ev evolution of this program. It's not a program that we were approached to see if we might consider steering this program about a year and a half ago. But really this is the result of at least 20 years or more of folk really being interested and wanting to build a good local you know, and regional seed system in the country. Um, even the person who, the reason why we have, this keeps, sorry about that, is that better? I'm a little too close to it. Can you all hear me well? Good. Um, the reason why the um, name Bout is in there is because the benefactor of the fund that is going to help us all in this room do this work together um, is, um, her name is Gretchen Bouton. Bauta, and she's part of the Weston family, a uh, family that started with a bakery and now has a huge grocery retail business. Um, but she's been actually supporting, we discovered, uh, with small grants from her own family foundation, her own personal foundation, seed work in Canada for over two decades. Has been working incredibly hard to try to make this happen. So for her, this is the culmination, this the beginning, really, not a culmination, but the final um, 
ability to actually see a project um, take shape of, of over two, two decades of work. And those are supposed to be representing seeds. <laughs> Our, our coordinator, um, our director of this program, Jane Rabinovitz, some of you have met, um, who's actually at the gathering, the EcoSign gathering in Montreal, as I'm speaking here, she's speaking there. She designed this, it's supposed to be seeds, but the way it's grown from some ideas in the early 70s and people who gathered in Saskatchewan for a seed meeting there, to, the, to COG, the Canadian Organic Growers, starting some, a version of a CD Saturday, to Sharon Rempel, many of you in this room may know Sharon Rempel, who's been residing in BC for the last several years, having the idea, together with USC Canada, to start, and the um, Van Dusen Gardens, to start CD Saturdays in 1989. Um, and from there, more and more people have coalesced uh, to get to this point where we have just been granted uh, including the pilot year, $5 million to try to get this seed work off the ground. We are delighted. Yeah, let's just, let's just do a big clap right now. <laughs> so um, I'm going to go through the elements of the program now. You can see, uh, and there are regional partners here. Farm Folk City Folk will be um, one of the partners helping to, to get this off the ground in BC. Um, and yeah, as we go along, um, you'll, you'll sort of see how it intends to shape out. But I really wanted to capture the notion that this isn't just something that happened overnight and isn't it great, somebody sort of saw the light. It is that very careful and determined work that goes on and on and on that you guys have been about for many, many years that makes these things happen. And that, in my view, is what democracy is about. So the working principles, um, we want to build on the existing momentum, clearly. We want to partner on everything. This isn't about USC empire building. This is about really wanting this to work. And the only way it's going to work is if you're all keenly involved in this process. We want to leverage resources. So this is just the beginning of funding for this. Um, we're going to hopefully be able to get other uh, family foundations, uh, other sources of funds, etc., interested in, in this and, and maybe, you know, be able to do more, spread more, etc. And we want to be absolutely transparent. So you will see we're going to put up, I'll put up in a minute, the totals for each of the various elements of this, this work. We've had, I can't, I don't know how many meetings, I'm looking at Heather because she's been part of some of the meetings, Mel has been part, Robin's been part. Craig, there's several people here. Dan, um, one of the original meetings uh, around this. Whoops, do I keep hitting something that? Oh, Windows. Okay. Uh, so this is the fruit of many uh, a consultation um, to try to determine how the resources should be divided, etc. Um, and uh, we want to make sure that it's a you know, everyone knows what's going on. But just before I, I move on to describing the various program streams, um, just a little note of the potential importance economically as well um, of, this, of this work. Right now, 32% um, of the vegetable and field crop seed purchased by organic farmers is conventional seed because they can't get the varieties in organics. And that represents over $18 million a year. So if you can imagine ecologically grown seed available, there's some income to be had as well. And the other key point about this is, though, that you can't get it in Canada at this point, or at least not nearly enough to meet the demand. This program is going to help uh, establish a source of really good, healthy, diverse, and ecologically grown seed in Canada. So the strategic objectives, two key uh, objectives. Oh, I can just look at this. I don't have to keep craning my neck. <laughs> uh, to conserve, expand, and commercialize high-quality, regionally adapted, ecologically grown Canadian seed. Uh, just take a moment. We're calling it ecologically grown. We're quite aware of the debate between um, certified organic and organic. Um, we are 
uh, however, wanting it to be grown with the principles of organics. Um, so it would not mean that someone who's transitioning into that would be necessarily out of the, the picture, but definitely the goal is uh, not using um, synthetic chemicals to, to do the, for the production. And also, one, one, well, they're two equal goals. They're also, we're also really wanting to strengthen the movement um, and the regional work uh, that then can be connected through a national network. So the partners today, um, all of you hopefully out there in your various ways, but key partners, um, USC Canada, of course, Seeds of Diversity Canada, Seeds of Diversity Canada, could be up here standing with us as well, but there, how many of you are linked or know Seeds of Diversity Canada? I imagine a lot of you, these fabulous catalogs. They are a key partner for us. We've worked very closely with them. Um, in fact, Jane just presented to their board meeting yesterday, um, and, uh, but too small to be able to steer this on their own, so that's where we came in, a little bit more experience and a little larger to be able to absorb that kind of resorts. Barn folk, city folk, we've got Heather over here. I guess everybody here must know Heather. Is that the case? No, okay, then stand up. <laughs> um, Organic Alberta, it's a very, very small organization that we hope will be strengthened through this process. And they're going to represent all three prairie provinces. And the other two organic, Manitoba and Organic Saskatchewan uh, organizations have uh, agreed that Organic Alberta is the one to help steer it in the prairies. Of course, we could have a person in each place, but you know, Canada is so huge. But this is this is how we can use the resources at this point. Everdale Organic Farm and Environmental Learning Center, that's based uh, between Guelph and Toronto. Do some of you maybe even train there or did did some work there? Any Evergreen graduates here? Everdale, I mean. And Atlantic Canada uh, Organic Regional Network, um, they're uh, based in New, New Brunswick at the moment, and they'll be helping to spearhead the, um, the Atlantic region's work. And then uh, Mrs. Bauta and, of course, the W. Garfield Weston Foundation. And there's another partner in the room who I just saw walk in a minute ago, Michaela, Organic Seed Alliance from, from Washington, um, uh, the state of Washington. I know she's going to be presenting, so you'll learn lots about them. But they're um, a, a partner that we discovered in this process, in this pilot year, and we're delighted to be able to be working with them on some educational materials and hopefully on training as well. We need to talk. <laughs> so the streams. Uh, first and foremost, support for farmers, applied research, public access, and I'll explain what that is in a minute, web extension service, and movement building. How am I doing for time? I'm okay? Oh, okay, good. We're, we're fine. Just let me know if I'm going on too long. So, stream number one, um, support for farmers. Um, this would mean around knowledge exchange, around se a seed facilitation fund, and market development. Um, the seed facilitation fund will be a fund um, that will be overseen by a group that we will gather together of, of sort of advisors, and it'll be kind of a small uh, fund, a small um, revolving fund that will, like for example, if someone or a co-op needs some new cleaning equipment, and that's really what's stopping them from expanding um, you know, their seed volume, etc., they could apply to this fund for, um, for some support to, to be able to do that. Uh, the terms have to be worked out. This is all very new, as you know, but the idea there is to have some of that extra resource for farmers where they're, they're limited in terms of their bulking up just because they just don't quite have that extra bit of, of money to, to, to move it a little bit further. And market development is something that was also identified as, as very important. Um, great to grow the seed, but do you have someone who's going to buy them? And so the, the program is going to help, hopefully, uh, that to ma help make those connections. Applied research, um, we're quite excited about this, and it is in some ways uh, modeled on um, work that USC Canada is supporting in the Global South, um, doing participatory plant research, um, participatory plant um, development through 
breeding rather through um, farmer researcher teams where um, sometimes it's the farmers that are in the leads and the researcher comes along to help out or a researcher who maybe uh, can help improve an oat variety, et cetera. But it's really going to be a fun to help get um, work on adapted local seed. Uh, public access, um, and that will include the uh, concept of seed libraries or banks. We tend to use banks at USC. We have been for some time, but the library way of framing that same issue actually is, is kind of a neat one because it's the idea you can go in and you have a loan and you return, return it back, et cetera. Whereas a bank, well, supposedly it works that way in banks, but they don't always work so well in our current financial context. And the other thing that fund will do is have some small grants to help CD Saturdays um, with seed exchange work and seed uh, first level seed saving training. Um, so the numbers somehow on this machine, they were right when I, <laughs> when I, when I had them on my computer. It's the Mac to the, the word, that's it. Mac to uh, the PC is the problem. Um, a web extension service, we're also quite excited about that, and uh, Seeds of Diversity Canada will t be taking the lead on this one, and have already done during the pilot year um, some really good work on developing a system. So all the stuff you've been reading in their catalogs will be on the, on the website, but also a system where you'll be able to identify seeds, where you can get seeds, how they grow under those growing conditions, how the climate might be impacting on those seeds, et cetera. So it really is meant to be a kind of extension service for farmers around, around seeds. And um, the first sort of layer of that production process is just about complete. And in the early new year, it will be up and running. So look forward to that. And then finally, the movement building and the partnerships. Um, I need to move on a bit. Okay, good. So outcomes, um, you saw the strategic objectives. We just flipped them around. Of course, street strengthen regional seed systems and um, regional and national organizations that are able to continue the work. Um, we really hope that the organizations that will help to launch this will make seed work a key part of their, of their mission and into the future be able to continue with their own sources of funds. What's next? We need to announce the program. Here I am doing it <laughs> in BC right now. Um, hiring regional coordinators. Farm survey. Please, those of you who are farmers, we have already uh, done a survey of gardeners, urban gardeners, um, small-scale farmers, uh, really small-scale farmers, urban farmers, but we are about to do one for larger, um, not large, but the Patrick Steiner type of farmer. <laughs> You know what I mean. And uh, seed events, etc. Some other ideas. Um, one of my personal goals is to be able to access resources for more farmer to farmer exchanges between the global north and global south. Seed policy work, policy work is critical. This fund is not, um, has not an identified pocket of resources for policy work. But certainly, it's USC's intent to try to raise funds to do that other important work. There will be some research when we do applied research. We need to know about seed regulation, but not active sort of advocacy work. Urban programming, um, I just learned a new term, world seeds, comes out of Toronto. But essentially, that's the seeds that immigrants bring with them from other places. And we would like that community to be integrated into this work, as well as northern communities. Um, the, the resources at this point are not sufficient to be able to do everything we want to do, but in time, hopefully. So building democracy one seed at a time also means you need to kiss your farmer. <laughs> and that's Mel over there. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Susan. We give her a little bit more time. I don't. Ma, <coughs> 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 isn't here yet. <coughs> you need the water. <coughs> I need some water. Patrick, come up and introduce yourself. <laughs> Thank you. <coughs> 
So as you know, we're still waiting for Mojave Kaplan and hopefully she'll arrive. She's on her way here by truck, bus, plane, or hitchhike or whatever it'll take to get here. <coughs> but we know she's a trooper, so she'll be here eventually. And she's gonna really talk a little bit about working as a seed saver in a very small local community and give us that perspective. And I was asked to bridge that time between the small community and the national to international picture that Susie just talked about. And uh, as soon as I heard that I was supposed to do that, I panicked. <laughs> 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 because I, I, many of you know me, I'm a, I'm a seed grower, I'm a farmer here in BC. I run Stellar Seeds with my wife. But at the same time, and so of course I'm very involved with the seed saving scene, but at the same time, it's a very rich, a very diverse, and I guess, yeah, I guess the word is diverse. It's, there's so much going on with seeds on different levels <coughs> in BC that I certainly don't know it all. But that's what these next two days are about. We're networking, we're sharing experiences, we're learning what each other do, does, we're getting up to speed on things, and we're coordinating a plan for where we might go forward and, and how we might work together. But as a farmer and as a person, you know, we all do this, we do the best we can. So I'm gonna do the best I can to summarize a little bit and give you some context for what, what the seed scene is here in BC. And, uh, and then we'll take that forward as a group over the next two days. So um, I guess, you know, I've, I've been working with seeds for maybe the last 15 years or so. So I can sort of talk about things in that time frame. And that's really just the most recent. But at the same time, what we have in this room here encapsulates a lot of people that have been doing some very significant work in those last 15 years, even just in the last five years, the last 10 years. And, it, and we also have some elders in this room who really were, they really began that grassroots uh, seed saving movement here in BC. Uh, some of the people here like Dan Jason, some of the people like Mojave Kaplan that will hope hopefully arrive soon. And then s some of you and some of us have worked with, studied under, apprenticed under some of the other mentors in the seed saving movement who aren't here tonight, but I'm sure they're here in spirit and the kind of work and the lessons that they taught us, they live on and they're what are bringing us to the moment that we're at right here, which is pretty exciting by the way. So, you know, I think, I think that in the maybe 15, 20, 30 years ago when some of the first small scale organic farmers decided we need to start doing some significant work around saving our own seeds. We, we don't wanna just rely on buying seeds from the seed companies anymore, or we wanna be able to rely less on it. Part of that came out of the consolidation in the, in the larger seed industry where smaller and medium seed companies were being bought up and often some of the seed lines that they offered were no longer available. And we were seeing a diminishment in the access to our agricultural biodiversity, you know, as farmers and as gardeners. All of a sudden, some of those varieties weren't available anymore. And I think some of the early seed saving was really a grassroots response to that, to say we need to, to reskill ourselves in, in this important process of farming. We need to close that, that loop, that close that circle the agricultural cycle, we need to grow some of our own seeds and save them. And I think that's where a lot of it started from, was with wanting to do that. And, and part of it was a self-reliance uh, thing as well for farmers and for organic farmers. Um, it's always been part of what we do in organic farming. We try to have as many of our inputs come from on the farm or within our very local community as possible. And the seed saving movement was really part of that as well. And, and then of course, I think organic production uh, principles, growing those seeds organically, adapting them to uh, our organic farming and our organic gardening needs was another really important part of it. And not only was, but still is, that's still a, a critical, crucial, central part to why we do, do all of our seed saving today. Um, it's practical and it's political and those are the sort of two, th you know, those are that encapsulates where it came from and, and why we still do it today. Um, at the same time, there's been changes. You know, we've, uh, we've developed, we've expanded. There's many more hands saving seeds now, I would say, in the last little while. We've seen it with this phenomenon of the explosion of Seedy Saturdays, 
across the province. Everybody here knows what a CB Saturday is? Definitely, it's, it's and these um, grassroots seed saving and seed sharing events that happen across BC and started in BC, first one started right here in Vancouver and, and they're kind of, it's, it's gone like a mushroom. It's, you know, it sends its mycelium out and they pop up in another community and there's another CD Saturday there. And that's kind of what's gone on across BC and across Canada now, it's all over the place. I think BC still has the most amount, you know, the, the highest density of CD Saturdays in any province, but it's really spread across the country. And, and the last I heard of it, there's starting to have some in Britain and in England, they've got some. I don't know in the US if anybody knows if there's any down there yet, but these, these kind of local uh, seed saving events and sharing the skills and the knowledge and trading and swapping seeds and selling seeds to each other has been a really big part of the seed saving movement in BC and it has brought, it has popularized it uh, amongst the citizen, the citizenry, is a strange word to use, but among people, it has popularized it and it has also brought more farmers into the experience of not only learning about saving seeds but giving them an avenue and a venue to, uh, to incorporate seeds into their farm as a bit of a, an income stream because more and more farmers are just putting their seeds in a few packets and showing up at the CD Saturdays with a table and that's adding to their revenue. So it's, it's really been a, a big part of it as, the, as that CD Saturday. And so it's, it's the seed, I would add to those, uh, those first three things around organic production, self-reliance, and, uh, and, and taking seed production back into to our own hands, I would add economic diversification for farmers and for, for urban farmers and for backyard gardeners as another part of the development of our local seed saving movement here in BC. And, and I think even these days you go there and you find people saying, uh, you know, they've got some interesting name for a variety that you've never heard and you say, well, what, tell me about that. And it turns out that they've done some crossing themselves on their farm, whether it was intentional or whether they were saving a sport. But people are now getting into breeding new varieties and actually saying, yeah, I'm not just a seed saver. I'm, I'm a plant breeder. I'm a grower. I've, I've got a vision for what I'm trying to do here. I'm starting a new, a new variety of, of onion. I've, cr I've crossed these two before. I'm doing, I've got this other kale. I call it homestead kale or whatever they do. And, and so we've got people taking on, taking the seed saving to another level. They're actually saying, we're, we're gonna become people who are gonna grow seeds that are specifically adapted and we've got in, intent of, of growing this for our climate, our region, um, for you know the day's length. We're looking for certain traits, whether it's cold hardiness or flavor or whatever it is. And, and this has been happening because of one, the kind of information that we get from uh, our, our mentors in the seed saving uh, world that we have right here in BC, but also because lately many of us have been taking advantage of learning opportunities with people further afield. Some of them, you know, we've brought in, and, and it's nice we've got Michaela Colley here from the Organic Seed Alliance. She's gonna be leading uh, some of the discussions this weekend. And that Organic Seed Alliance has been a real resource for people here in BC over the last five to 10 years. We've brought some of the various instructors and uh, employees there, John Navazio and others have come up here to teach courses about seed saving and they've taught us a little bit of work around breeding and selection. And we've moved forward with that kind of thing and that's really become, I think, an, uh, an important part of the skill building that we're doing as uh, farmers and seed growers here. And it's one of those things, and it takes resources, and it's one of those things that I really hope that the kind of work that we're going to hopefully see happening through uh, the influx of expertise and, and money that uh, with this project from the Bauda Initiative that we'll see going forward. I mean, I I've done a lot of work with USC over the years, and one of the things that I've always been really impressed by is the programs that you deliver in some of the, your partner countries uh, in Honduras, in Ethiopia there. Well, one of the examples that I found so inspiring in Honduras is this little tiny NGO there called FIFA. And they work with farmers and they've developed these little farmer education cells in communities. 
And these farmers work sharing their own knowledge with each other, but also in tandem with, um, you know, seed seed experts from the more professional seed community there, uh, from the universities and stuff like that. And together, the farmers and uh, the university folks have actually bred varieties using participatory varietal selection techniques and participatory plant breeding uh, approaches, where these farmers have taken varieties of corn and beans and made them work better on their farms and actually increased their own yields to the point where in some of the communities they no longer go through what they used to call the hunger season and they no longer go through that because they've increased their yields, they've increased the capacity of their, their foods to, to store longer. And it's really neat to see these farmers have done that kind of thing and that they had the access to the, to the mentorship and, and that. And that's the kind of thing I'd really like to see mm -hmm. those of us here being able to learn and being able to access. I've been jealous of that for quite a while. <laughs> so I wanna see that kind of thing happening here <laughs> now, you know? So that's, that's been a, a big part of, uh, all of that has been part of where we've come from and where I think we're going to in BC. But it goes beyond just the vegetables too. Uh, some of the folks here have, have, have focused on high protein grains for a long time. Dan Jason's been a, one of the guys who's really focused on that. And there's, you know, we talked about Sharon Rempel. She's a, a wheat breeder who's really talked about wanting to do more local wheat breeding here in BC. And we have people growing heritage grain seeds specifically for specialty markets, uh, uh, you know, bakers who wanna bake artisanal breads and things like that. So we have this movement, not just around vegetable seed, but also around grains happening. In the interior of BC where I live, in the small community of Armstrong, for many years there's existed the BC Organic Milling Co-op, which was a cooperative of farmers who were specifically growing, you know, larger acreages of grains, uh, providing each other with grain seeds and green manure crops, and then selling them to farmers all over that the interior region there. That, that's morphed and changed a little bit. It's no longer a co-op, it's a privately run entity now. Many of you might have heard of it, it's the Fieldstone Granary. But they still continue to contract out with local farmers around growing all kinds of grain seeds and oil seeds and crops for uh, milling and flour and stuff like that. And they have the capacity to, to not only take those seeds but to then clean them and, and bag them up and market them out. And so we have all these little pieces of networks here in the province that are doing these things. Um, and many of you are represented right here today. And what we're looking to do maybe in, in, in the years to come is coordinate how we work together and figure out a, a more cohesive strategy towards creating a seed system that meets the needs of not only our gardeners and our farmers, but our other, our other food, I don't know what you want to call them, the, the artisan bakers and the people who, who then take those seeds and some of those products and make, make our food out of it. Um, you talked ab about food sovereignty, you linked food sovereignty and seed sovereignty together in your title there. And it's so important to remember that, this work that we do with the seed saving, it's the basis of our food supply. Mojave has arrived? Oh no, no, I thought I saw Mojave in the back, it wasn't <laughs> her. Um, I thought you were also her. <laughs> So, yeah, one of the other things, as well as what we're doing with, uh, with the seed saving here and what we're gonna be doing this weekend is talking about some of these other novel approaches to sharing seeds, to, uh, to organizing our seeds together. So we have workshops around the, the, the seed libraries movement. We have skills of people here who've been talking about seed banking for years. Uh, we have it from a, a more international level, but remember that the seed banking that USC works with is all really micro scale seed banking in those communities. And so they have m intimate knowledge and skills about the same kind of level of seed banking that we uh, are starting to do here in, in BC. Dan has started the, the, you know, in partnership with many people he works with, has started the Salt Spring Seed Sanctuary. It was meant as a seed bank. And he's been g going around and lecturing and talking to people all about how to start seed banks. Across Canada, he's been doing this. And people are starting them out locally. Where I lived in the Shishwap region, we started a, a local seed bank there uh, a few years back. 
So this has become another vehicle for uh, a way of preserving and disseminating local seeds. And it's extremely localized, right? But at the same time, all these people are often kind of trying to reinvent the wheel. And, it, and that's why we wanted to have a workshop here about, about the seed library movement, about seed banking, so that people can share some of that information with each other and, and work with a small model and take that forward. So I think the next couple days, we're just gonna be really learning from each other. We're, we have lots of uh, resource people here who are leading workshops, but at the same time, I know that most of those people, I, I know many of those people in the workshops, they're not the type to sit up at a podium and monologue. They're gonna wanna share their experiences and knowledge with you, but then it's up to us as a group here to take it and to start dialoguing in these workshops and start sharing information with each other. So many of you here are involved already in local seed saving movements, local food movements. Uh, and we built this whole weekend on the model of the, the BC Food Systems Network Gathering, which is a very, very participatory model. And it's all about sharing information with each other. So I think that's where we're gonna be taking it forward, Heather, and you might wanna I'm, I'm step in at this point. Okay. Thank you very much.